Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we have muted everybody, uh, but there will be plenty of time after the presentation for questions. Um, and for that, we'll, uh, you can put questions in the chat or use the raise hand feature. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to oops, share a couple quick um, notes about upcoming programs. Um, Land Trust is sponsoring a wonderful webinar coming up on May 9th which is about why birds matter and their role as uh, indicators of ecosystem uh, change and potentially decline. And that's with Trevor Lloyd Evans, um, uh, who's a fellow with the Manimate Center. Um, and then I also wanted to point out a couple great uh, gardening for the changing climate events, uh, some eco garden tours coming up and also really exciting, we're almost to Nomo May. So if you haven't uh, heard about Nomo May and would like to participate, there's still time, you can go to the Lincoln Common Ground website and learn more about that and uh, keep your mower dust, <laughs> dusty in the shed for another month. Um, and then we also do have um, a noticing walk coming up on May 2nd, this coming Tuesday. If you'd like to sign up for that and receive information about where to meet, uh, you can find that on our website. Um, so just a quick, um, a little, tidbit that the Conservation Department um, and Conservation Commission uh, wanted to just make sure we um, are sharing is uh, invasive plant control is like a huge thing, uh, but please, 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 if you are doing work uh, in or near wetlands, um, please reach out to the Conservation Department before doing um, invasive removal or, or native replanting. Um, it's great work, but they like to just make sure that everything's being done um, by the book and keep track of projects that are happening around town. And then lastly, I would like to welcome Diana, who is an eco-gardener based here in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Um, she's a real expert on native plants and building a garden that uh, is, is creating biodiversity. Um, so with that, I am going to share that and let me share the slides for Diana. Okay. And Diana, I will let you take it away. Okay, great, Bryn. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me um, present this information today. Um, yes, I do have a small eco gardening business here in Lincoln called Monarch Meadows. And my mission is to try to help people transition from lawns to a regenerative landscape. Um, I'm trying to, um, I've gone all out. Our, our yard is almost all meadow, um, just with a small play yard for our son and um, lots and lots of pads for him to run around in. So I went all in, but I understand, um, you know, sometimes it's good to just to stick your toes in the water a little bit before you get all the way in. So um, that is the reason for this concept of, um, of pocket meadows. And I'm gonna show you a few different ways to, uh, to stick your toes in the, in the, in the water. Um, so my slogan would not be you know, to kill your lawn or something like that, um, but it would be probably something more like um, cardboard is my best friend um, because I use it a lot and I'll show you <laughs> ways to use it. You're probably familiar with um, some of the sheet mulching workshops at Codman. I do a lot of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think turf grass lawns are good for some things like a kid's play area, but it, I, I like to imagine it more as an area rug, not wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Next. Yep. Yeah, so um, turf grass lawns are the default option for the American landscape, and there are a lot of problems with this, one of them being um, all the gasoline that they often use. Um, the advent of the gas mower was a boon to the lawn care industry and terrible for the environment um, in many different ways. Um, the colonists imported the um, lawn aesthetic from the old country, 
And British soil is well suited for turf grass because it's damper there. They get a lot more rain. And um, the soil is not as acidic as it is in most of New England. Um, also, a lawn, you know, it, it symbolized wealth and status. It was a way of saying, like, I, you know, I have all this space and I don't need to, you know, use all of it to raise crops or animals. And I have lots of people at my disposal who can cut all of it by hand. Um, so you can see how um, that sort of ideal, um, you know, was, was um, very popular in the mid century with the advent of, of this new technology. Next. And um, the chemical companies came up with the fertilizers and the pesticides and the herbicides to try to create that nice, neat, smooth look of coveted greenness. So I think that's a pretty funny ad. Be honest, Scott. So I've been uh, laughing at the uh, their new um, <clears throat> the new Scots ad with the 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 very uh, brawny, brash Scotsman. Um, their ads are pretty funny. Next. And do you think spring should be here all summer? Um, I mean, not to mention how much water turf grass needs around here. Um, a lot of us experienced uh, seeing our lawns turning very brown last summer in the drought, and it just makes it clear that, um, you know, it's right plant in the right place. Um, they need an awful lot of support to, to look good, and it's just, it's just not sustainable. Um, all of that water uh, could have gone to much, much better use someplace else. Um, a pollinator meadow only needs water to get established. And then once it's established, it, it's not gonna need any more water in the subsequent years. I, I didn't have to water any of our perennials um, at all um, in our established meadows and things looked, things looked great last year. So um, next. So yes, so the appetite for lawns was really a big thing after World War II. It was one of those things, you know, that really took off with the marketing industry, kind of like diamonds, um, you know, for engagement rings. It was the, you know, the new norm, keeping up with the Joneses. But look at this cute house back in the 20s. The norm back then was, um, you know, to have a nice big white, white, you know, nice big front porch that you would socialize with your neighbors on and um, you know maybe so you'd have some chickens, some classic perennials, and um, some vegetables. So <laughs> next, so um, so I'm going to talk about a few different ways to get into meadow making. Um, I imagine that. A lot of you are going to participate in No Mo May this year, and you might have seen Rachel Nuras' excellent presentation a couple weeks ago. Um, so if you're going to just let your grass grow, um, there are certain plants that you could just plant right into it. Um, a lot of hardy, vigorous plant, plants like purple love grass, mountain mint, asters, and goldenrod, they'll do just fine. Um, you can just... Um, you know, just even dig up some weeds that you might see that are coming up in your lawn and just um, plant them right in there. You should plant them fairly close together so that they connect and they make a swath and so that the pollinators can find these things such as, you know, the asters and the the uh, the mountain mint and the, the goldenrod. Next. <clears throat> And blazing stars, which are the ones on the top, can be directly planted into medium to moist turf grass area. Just mulch around it to, to suppress competition. To minimize digging and the carbon release that results from it, I dig up invasives and immediately fill in the holes with plugs. One project could be digging up lesser celandine and then replacing it with this in a spot that gets at least a half day of sun. So. Um, blazing stars is another one of those things. Sometimes when I get busy 
you know, on a weeding project, I just have things to replace them with immediately because um, nature abhors a vacuum. If you disturb the soil, something else may very well <laughs> pop, back, pop right back up um, that you don't want. So the lower tray here is full of purple lovegrass. Um, that's going to be happy in a different sort of site from the other one, um, like a dry, sandy area where turf grass is really struggling, like in some spot where it's, you know, where it turned completely brown and died last summer, you can put in some purple love grass. Um, and I would often plant this in the same way, digging out a problem plant, swapping it for that one. And um, this and the other warm season meadow grasses, like little blue stem, um, which is offered through the LLCT and is really, really that through their plant sale and is really important for um, a lot of Lepidoptera. Um, they don't they don't look like much right now because it's early in the season, but they're going to look beautiful later on in the summer and they look wonderful in the winter with their little seed heads and some a little bit of snow on them and the birds really, really appreciate having the seeds to eat and, and places to nest. And um, I just wanted to say that anybody can buy wholesale plugs from Azelle Native Plants. It's a great resource. Um, you don't have to have, um, you know, a professional discount to get them at wholesale. Uh, next. So another method is the cake pan method. Um, that's a term that I've come up um, with just to explain what I'm doing with um, that edging, it's called, it's its Dakota tin. Um, it's sourced from um, old barns out west. Um, and so it's a, it's a recycled material and it's wonderful to work with because it's very flexible. And I, I like that um, rusted steel look. It really looks nice, I think, against all of the green here. Um, and then I fill it with, compost, um, stuff like cardboard, wood shavings, brown paper, um, stuff like that. And then and then I added um, just some basic soil. Sometimes I'll use something um, from, you know, from our spent vegetable gardens because we replace half of that soil with fresh um, compost and loam every year. So I just take it out of there and I cover all of that, all of that brown compost with that. Maybe sometimes I'll put in um, a little bit of vegetable compost, but these plants don't really need, need that much support. Um, most of them, they're pretty tough. And so I seeded this one with some New England asters in the early winter. And um, it's fun to be gardening in the winter. Um, and the seeds need to be out in the cold weather and the, the, the dampness to, to germinate. So next. And there it is. It's been seeded with New England asters. And um, you can see that it's on top of a base of, of cardboard. And um, that's directly on a lawn and um, as that it's a very thin layer in that particular picture, um, maybe an inch and a half to two inches of aged um, mulch there right on top of cardboard. And um, I can expand that um, by adding another piece later on and making it a bit bigger. Um, but it's not going to continue to need that much support for long, the support from the Dakota tin. Um, I'm just building up on top of the earth instead of digging into it. Um, it's all about accretion and composting and overwintering. It's a sort of a different way of doing things. Um, next. And I did it here with some lupin seeds. Um, those are going to want to stay where they are. Um, they don't like to be uh, transplanted, um, but it'll be the beginning of a lupin bed. And I might put a few other things in there too. I cover it with some netting. Um, I just use some um, um, safety 
uh, not safety pins, paper clips or something like that, just to put the netting in place, just so the little birds don't don't get it. Next. And here is part of a um, bed that I um, I I filled with um, little bluet plugs. I want wanted to um, cultivate quite a lot of them because um, they're just such a fun ground cover plant. And um, so every now and then I'll divvy them up and um, they self seed and it's it started to. Um, expand quite a bit so and they they get along well with others is they're not the super pushy um native plants they get along with other pollinator favorites you'll you'll see what the you'll see what the project came out like in a little bit okay next and so that's that same little bed that i had the bluets in and i added um several other things and it's gonna get it's gonna get very dense in there pretty fast. Um, but as this plants as the plants multiply and need more space, I'll find lots of places to put them. Maybe I'll put them in another cake pan, raised bed, or maybe in a spot that was sheet mulched all winter um, that could use use some you know some good pollinator plants. Um, next, so. That's what it looks like early season. That one was built on a tree stump. And then I had put in all kinds of sticks and logs and cardboard, similar materials. And I amended it with soil from last year's vegetable beds. And this one features creeping flocks and bluets as a ground cover, Appalachian sedge and purple love grass, Jacob's ladder, Eastern columbine, Virginia bluebells, zizia, nodding onion and a high bush blueberry and I think what I'll do is I'm going to make an adjoining um, cake pan pocket meadow right next to it where the cardboard is um, and I'll have more um, later season pollinator plants in that one. Next. So talking about the lasagna method um, it helps like if you're trying to kill turf grass, um, cut it as short as you can. Um, I haven't always had to do that, um, but it's been so dry lately that I think it really is the best way to go about it. And then um, put several layers of cardboard on top. Um, you know, it's, it's, if it's been dry, it's, it's good to um, get it wet so it really adheres uh to the to the soil and then use whatever you can to just weigh it down i use you know i'm, I'm using my my kids um basketball net here you can use logs or bricks or pavers or stones anything anything handy and then you can leave it like that um you know from either from the fall until you know throughout the winter and then plant into it in the spring or you could do it the other way around and um, you know, just um, put, the, put the lasagna down on the ground in the spring and then plant into it in the fall. Next. So here is a project that I was working on over the winter. Um, a lot of invasives were removed from this site and then we mulched it with two to three layers of cardboard and then about a two inch <clears throat> layer of aged wood mulch and compost. And it was seeded with a lot of vigorous native perennial seeds. Hmm. There was no digging involved in this at all. Um, I don't like to dig because it releases carbon. You know, I'll dig as much as I have to to pull something out. Um, but digging's a lot of work too. It's also kind of honor. So um, it's it's more fun to to do it this way just by by building up and the results are better and when you dig um you might be exposing you know seeds of something unwanted to the light and then it'll germinate so um so next and Doug Tallamy um had suggested the raking leaves method um we do rake leaves in the fall off of our play yard area, you know, our little um, area rug of grass. And um, 
you could just take a leaf pile. I've done this, I've done this before and it worked quite well. Um, you just have to let them sit there long enough to make sure that any um, insects that are in the leaf pile have, um, have hatched. So you have to wait until the temperature is optimum, but then you can move it out of the way. And um, usually there's a really nice, rich um, bed of soil underneath it. Next. And in this meadow, I'm using a combination of different methods um, where the cardboard is, I'm gonna put in some plugs and some more mature plants directly under the cardboard because the um, grass is almost, almost dead. Um, and what's there, it has been subdued enough. It's not really going to be a problem. And the cake pans are filled with seeds and plugs. And the metal will stay in place until the roots have developed and stabilized the plants and soil. So basically, will be the, the, the that ground that that um, mulch and soil that you see there is going to get a bit compacted over time. It's going to shrink. <laughs> and we can shore shore it up a little bit. Um, but it's not as deep as it might look in the picture. And also the other things that are going to be planted there are going to be mulched with lots of wood chips too. Um, so it's all, it's all going to even out, but it does have a bit of a modular look at the moment. Um, so we've got all kinds of methods going on at this, at this site. Next. And Invasives management. Um, a lot of young garlic mustard was smothered here. Young, I'm saying, before it went into flower. Um, I rescued the good plants. There were some, um, some native irises and um, jack in the pulpits and, and things like that were, that were in the fray. So I dug those up and transplanted them. And after that, I, um, I, I, I covered it up. Um, with five overlapping layers of cardboard. <clears throat> and then I blanketed it with some coconut coir, which is a byproduct of the coconut industry. And um, some slate stones just to anchor it down and remind me that it'll be ready to spread with two to three inches of aged wood chips and a little compost in the fall and then seeded with violets. So I'm not digging. I'm not going to expose any seeds, and I'm going to give it enough time for the um, allelopathic um, chemicals from the uh, garlic mustard to just dissipate into the earth. So we should be in good in good shape by then. But you know, I have little visual markers just to just to keep track of of what my plans are and help me visualize what's happening. Next. And after we pull out the burning bush, that we have a lot of that around here, um, with the weed wrench, which is a great tool to use because it pulls things out very efficiently. Um, it doesn't really disturb the soil as much as using a, a shovel. Um, we're going to immediately replant the soil with high bush blueberry, which thrives in the exact same spots as a burning bush. It also has a similar beautiful color, that nice red in the fall. And we're also going to put some black-eyed Susan, Susan seeds in there to um, keep invasives out of the disturbed soil. Next. And, you know, I know that this yard of ours is never going to be free of invasives. There's just, there's just, just no, there's just no way. Um, you know, especially since we're not going the chemical route. Um, but you have to prioritize what you go after. Um, vinca is considered invasive. Um, I'm not digging it up, but I'm just doing my best to subdue it a bit with the cardboard and the subsequent introduction of some robust pollinator plants and ericaceous plants that like the same conditions, such as azaleas, blueberries, cranberries, and leucotho. And over time, I believe that they will they will take over. And um, at least the vinca has flowers that are of some benefit to 
pollinators. It's better than turf grass that way. Um, and in the meantime, I'll go after the barberry and the, the bittersweet. Next. <clears throat> so you have to pick your battles, vinca or knotweed. They're both invasive, but which one is more likely to be a real problem? Um, I think that's an easy, easy question considering um, how much knotweed <laughs> we see all along the, the highways and the roads. So I'm going after the knotweed. Um, and the vinca is supposed to be a good carbon sink. Next. So thinking a little bit about what a weed is, um, it kind of depends on who you ask. And again, it's it's right plant in the right place. Because um, a lot of people considered Virginia creeper to be a weed, um, but I've come to love it for its ability to cloak unhelpful plants. Um, for example, I'm encouraging it to grow all over the vinca that we have because it does have a lot of benefit to, to native wildlife. Um, it provides cover and it produces dark blue berries that feed birds and little creatures every fall. It also helps with erosion, but there are some places where you definitely wouldn't want to put it. I mean, you wouldn't want to grow it on your walls <laughs> of your house. And um, on trees, sometimes you have to watch out for it. It can get carried away. And, um, but I've never actually seen that happen. I've just heard about it, so. Next. So <clears throat> living mulch. Um, when wild strawberries and violets pop up in my design native plant gardens, I welcome them. I don't pull them out. Um, some people consider these to be weeds, but they provide a ground cover that's vital to many um, pollinators. Um, they're at the top of the list, um, according to both um, Talamy's list of what's best for our zip code, and also um, Dr. G. Gear as well, he mentions them. So they, I find that they mingle well with the other native plants that are of a similar robust nature, like they do well with, um, you know, the asters and the goldenrods. They all seem to balance each other out as a team. They have similar um, temperaments, I guess. And they nurture the butterflies flitting around here and they function as a living mulch, which is better than, better than wood chips, ultimately. And they help keep the ground healthy and, and damp enough. I recommend working with light touch plants, especially if you're um, venturing out beyond, you know, if you're doing direct planting or lasagna gardening. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend these for the for a little bitty cake pan meadow. Um, but one of my favorites is mountain mint, um, which needs no help in filling in a big sweep of ground. And it is absolutely covered with bees. They love it. Deer hate it. Um, and it's, it smells like my favorite bug spray. So I think it, 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 it makes sense that ticks don't like it, um, just because it's, it smells very much the same. Um, and I use it to keep deer from munching coneflowers and other plants that deer might prefer. So sort of made a, a bit of a moat of that. Um, I think of things as moats. Also, we use a lot of wood chips too, um, because supposedly ticks don't like to cross wood chips. Um, gravel too, we use that right around the house because we used to have ticks climbing up on our back door when we first got here. But we had a landscape that was dominated by things like barberry and some of the really pervasive <laughs> heavy duty invasives because our house had been abandoned for 10 years. So it was quite quite a project working on it. Um, next. So native self-seeders like coneflowers, um, which I love because the butterflies love them and they attract so many butterflies. Um, they'll create a generous progeny to expand your meadow. Annuals and biennials like flea banes and black-eyed Susans and um, and uh, partridge pea too, um, also um, um, touch me not is another one for a damper spot. 
Um, they all fill in the gaps and they keep weeding to a minimum. It's so much easier and so much more beneficial to just put in more layers of things that, that you know, are just going to thrive um, in your space rather than doing so much, so much work. And you're benefiting nature and you'll see a lot more, you know, hummingbirds, for example, they love the, um, the touch me not. Next. Asters and goldenrods. Um, here's a picture of New England asters and goldenrods. Um, again, it's a good option if you're going to do direct planting into your into your uh, no mow may lawn and turn it into a meadow. Right plants in the right place. Next, <clears throat> planting densely. So I um, I'm doing some planting into ground uh, that was lasagna over the winter. And um, they're planted together closely, maybe about six to eight inches apart. Um, it's purple love grass. It's gonna do really well here because it's, it's a dry spot. And um, I plant them together closely because I want them to fill in quickly and exclude the invasives. Next. <clears throat> so um, all of this works because of cardboard and wood chips as local as possible. Um, sometimes I'll get um, wood chips delivered from for free through a, a um, app called Chip Drop, um, but you do have to be careful. I mean, I'm they're 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 usually I, I haven't had any problems, um, but. I do ask them, to, you know, um, not to, I don't want any brush or anything invasive. Um, you know, I've got a nice mix of, of pine and hemlock there. Um, it's just great to have a lot of wood chips on hand um, because it's, um, you know, if you do some weeding, you can immediately patch up a spot. If you don't have plants available, available to put right in, just with some, some cardboard and then a layer of wood chips. Cardboard, we've got plenty of that, um, you know, from all the online shopping. And um, I leave it out in the rain just so that it's easier to peel the tape off of it. That's the really niggly, annoying thing about cardboard. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's really worth it. I mean, if it's in there long enough, you can plant right through it. Or if you're picking it up, then you can just move it aside and then easily just break it up into smaller pieces. Um, it's all about just keeping, uh, you know, the seeds of the undesirable <laughs> plants underground and just building things up and making the soil better. Next. And I use a lot of native annuals like partridge pea, black-eyed Susan, and evening primrose. Um, they support pollinators while perennials are getting established. And they also provide lots of seeds to easily make more pocket meadows in other spots. Next. Um, I took a different kind of approach to seed preparation. Um, I, uh, these are lupin seeds. Um, you're supposed to go through this process of soaking them and then nicking them with a knife or else um, rubbing them on sandpaper. And I'll say I've had luck before um, just directly planting them into the ground. But this winter here at my house, I, I just left them out on some cardboard and let the birds eat them because it's essentially doing the same process as going through the whole soaking and, and uh, nicking or scraping um, experience. And um, there, are, there are a lot of little seedlings coming up out there um, just in random places in the garden. So I think it might've worked, different, different way to do it. I, you know, I just, bought a lot of them in bulk and thought, okay, this will be a fun way to, to, to feed some birds this, this winter. Next. Um, 
I leave the stems and the leaves through the winter because they are habitat for overwintering insects. Although it's really tempting to get in there early in the spring, I like I, I have to stay out of the meadow garden unless I'm carefully managing a young um, invasive, you know, dealing with some young invasives. It, early spring is the best time to spot the in, invasives because they leaf out sooner than other things do often. Um, but I try to stay out of the garden as much as I can um, in the early spring because I don't want to compact the soil. I don't want to smush anything, you know, any any fauna that might be living in there in the leaves. Um, and then I keep the stems up until the insects have emerged. And then when the temps are consistently at least 50 degrees day at night, then I employ the chop and drop method. Um, mulching the perennials in place with the stems broken up into a few pieces. And I keep the stems at about like between two and three feet tall, but anything that's higher than that, I do the chop and drop. Next. Um, when I'm direct planting um, or dealing with the remnants of grass after lasagna gardening over the winter. I use the dead turf from under the cardboard as mulch around the new plugs. If it's still alive, I place it upside down, roots up. It's almost like a little like rug. <laughs> and so I just use that as mulch. It's, 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 it's right there and it doesn't need to be hauled away and it does the trick. So next. You have to remember to water because um, natives are low maintenance. Um, once your your meadow garden is established, um, you're just going to have to check it for invasives every now and then. But it'll be you know really really you know practically hands off aside from that. But the first year you do have to make sure that that they're getting enough water. Next. And here's a picture of our meadow garden and um, it didn't need any water last summer to look vigorous in spite of the drought. Um, I mean, everything there is doing just fine. It's, you know, it's all, it's evolved to, to live here in this climate. And, um, and it's easy, <laughs> so, you know, and there, there are some things in there that, you know, like there's some mullein, that's popping up, you know, it's not native, but I'm just gonna leave it there because, um, I don't know, I think like a lot of weeds are really pretty benign annuals. And then, you know, a weed, it, it sort of depends on, it depends on who you ask, I guess. <laughs> so it's a very laid back sort of approach to gardening and it, it feels, it feels good. It feels, um, I don't know, it feels much more beneficial and generative and more like, a, okay, let's let's observe what's going to happen. You know, let's see how nature is going to design this with us, you know, instead of, you know, I'm trying to keep this under control and it's got to look a certain way. Okay, next. So biomimicry, um, speaking of nature. Most traditional landscapes have one or two layers. You think of an azalea garden with mulch underneath or a perennial garden with nothing above or below. Or sometimes you, you know, you'll see houses, um, you know, Dan Jaffe has made the, the joke about um, meatballs and rocket ships. Um, but, um, but for a designed plant community, all three layers are needed, mimicking how plants grow in the wild, so. Here's an image from Mount Cuba last weekend in Delaware. Mount Cuba is a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, but you can see that there's um, uh, Canadian ginger. There's a ground cover there underneath um, some celandine poppies and some um, columbine and other plants. But it's, it's you know, there's several, several layers of plantings and they all work together as a team. Next, P. Rudolph is definitely a wonderful designer to, to look at. Um, he's very famous, of course. 
Um, notice the density and, and layers and selection of meadow plants. The seed heads and tall grass stalks are beautiful in the fall and winter and will continue to sustain many birds with food and offer shelter to them and overwintering insects. Next. <clears throat> this is how the meadow looks at Mount Cuba, how it looked last weekend. Um, they left the gold, the, uh, excuse me, they left the blue stem up over the winter, part of it. They probably mow it in, in sections, um, different sections every year, I would imagine. Um, but they said that they keep their turf grass no lower than, than four inches um, in their more manicured areas. And um, so there's, there's blue stem, little blue stem in the back there in the top left. And then there's running ground. So that's the first prominent meadow forb here at this site. Um, the running groundsel is a robust one in the aster family, and it makes itself right at home. It would do fine just directly planted into most turf grass situations. So if you want to do direct planting into your Nomo May lawn, um, that's, that's one, to, one to try out. Next. Um, here are some early pollinator plants at Mount Cuba. Um, in the eastern woodlands, many of our pollinator plants emerge in the shade before the trees leaf out. Understory trees like eastern redbud are some of the first native plants to bloom and provide for pollinators. Although many of the spring blooming herbaceous perennials are often described as shade lovers, I found that trillium, columbine, and Virginia bluebells are at home in sunny positions among summer meadow plants because they're ephemeral. So they they're, they wither away um, in the heat of the summer. Anyway, they come out before the leaves are out on the trees. So um, they do they do just fine. Next. Sundial lupin. Um, these are directly planted by birds and they're essential to many Lepidoptera. Um, the endangered Carner blue butterfly depends upon this plant to complete its life cycle. Um, and beware of planting the Western non-natives here um, because it's actually toxic to the Carner butterfly. There's so much to learn about the relationships between plants and insects. Next. Here's a meadow in July. Um, lots of this meadow garden blazes with bright colors of Joe pie weed, coneflower, goldenrod, Turks cap lilies, and red bee balm. Next. And this garden is full of butterflies that visit the coneflowers, hummingbirds hovering around the honeysuckle vine, and bees in the mint and asters. Next. And thank you very much for watching my presentation. Um, special thank you to Bryn for helping me out with my, my tech issues. And um, many thanks to um, Mothers Out Front and Emily and Rachel for all of your encouragement and support and, and um, for all these opportunities to, to learn with people. So it's a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. That was really wonderful. Um, I, I love seeing the pictures and it's getting me excited for spring and summer <laughs> gardening. <laughs> and I can't wait to see what comes up in my own garden. Um, so I'm going to allow participants to unmute themselves now and um, feel free to pop questions into the chat or you can use the raise hand feature, which is under the reactions button. Um, and if you raise your hand, we'll call on you and invite you to share a question or comment uh, out loud. So we'll give folks a few minutes to think of questions. Um, in the meantime, Diana, I was really interested because um, I saw the pictures of the cake pan meadows and I didn't realize that you take away the metal after a while. So I'm just curious um, a little bit more about what it looks like after that happens and have you seen like how the roots hold hold that shape um, and do you put other things around it afterwards well it 
You can do it with the 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 shorter um, the the Dakota tin. It, it comes in different um, different heights, and that one that I completed today, the springtime pollinator meadow, that's going to stay where it is. I'm not taking the tin off of that. It's just much too deep. But the ones um, in the um, like in the the combination meadow, um, it may take two or three years if I don't shore something up against it and keep continuing with it with another cake pan or um, add something to it. But those 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 um, strips of metal are eventually going to go. It's not it's not a permanent fixture, but you can keep sort of building the earth up. You know, it's like this. Um, in some situations, you can't build it up too much. In that situation, I had to be a little bit conservative about building it up um, because you don't want to do that um, in all situations. But it's the 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 roots are very very fibrous. These plants and they they they're going to hold that ground together and they're going to make it um, stronger and more resilient. And then. By the time it's ready to take the um, the edging off, I could either just like shore it up, like you're making a sandcastle with more 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 material like mulch and wood chips, and 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 just plant some plant something else into it, and it will become more more solid. But it's a it's a slow process. This isn't you know this isn't something that um, gets done in a weekend. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, I love how it makes it so easy that you, you don't have to dig. You can just pick a spot and start building on top of it, which I think uh, a lot of us look out at our lawn or our, our invasive patch and think, oh, I don't want to tackle that today. Um, so I think this is really an inspiring way to, to, to see a different way of doing it. Um, so we have a question from Georgia um, about pulling creeping Charlie, which I think is also called ground ivy. Um, do you have that in your garden? Do you pull it or, or leave it? I don't, um, but I don't have that much of it because things are um, planted very, very thickly. Um, I would pull it or smother it. I'd probably be more likely to just smother it and then plant something on top of it. Um, but it depends on how tall it is, how far along it is. Um, but yeah, creeping Charlie, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't scare me as much as other things do. <laughs> um, yeah, and the the wholesale nursery um, is is all native plants, um, great resource, and they have. Um, Excellent blogs and articles too. I love that company, Izell. Anybody can order stuff from Izell Native Plants. So Z E L. Z E L. I Z E L. I'll put it in the chat there. Um, okay, and then a question from Annie. Do you have a, a book that you like about the interrelationships between plants and insects? Um, when thinking about creating a garden that supports insects and biodiversity? Um, I think the Doug Tallamy books are probably the best thing that I've read. Um, although I just, uh, somebody just um, shared a um, video of um, Dr. G Gear um, talking more about that, that really, made a lot of sense. Um, I mean, I, I was beginning to understand concepts um, such as, you know, a, a, a butterfly's proboscis not, you know, being long enough to get into certain types of tubular flowers and, and um, you know, and that we should watch out for um, native ours because sometimes these plants get so over-engineered that they're not accessible to these insects anymore, um, you know, the nectar or the pollen. Um, but if you follow um, Dr. G 
years work. There was a there was a really good video that really um, it, it, it made things much clearer about um, what they're learning, especially with, with bees. So mm -hmm. yeah, but, we can find it and share it afterwards. Yeah, with the group maybe. Yeah, yeah, we should. Um, but yeah, Talamy's book is accessible too. But he's um, I think he's a, little, a bit more focused on caterpillars and. And uh, I think Dr. G Gear is more be focused. Um, yeah. um, Chris has a question about um, a species of asters that would be good for direct planting. Hi, Chris. I think um, just about any sort of aster would do fine. Um, I am a huge fan of New England Aster because I love the purple color and it looks great with golden rods. They're both um, good um, fall bloomers. They're um, really important for a lot of, you know, end of season foragers. So New England Aster is, is something to look for. It can get very tall, um, but if it looks too, you know, if you don't want it to look too gangly, you can give it the, the Chelsea crop. Um, in early June, and then it will still still flower for you. Just it'll just be a bit shorter, not look quite as wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always a, a struggle to tame the garden a little bit so that it looks, how we say, respectable, but also make sure that it's still providing that great shelter for insects. Before I planted so much mountain mint, the deer were doing the, the Chelsea crop for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a great tip because I know, especially here in Lincoln, there's a lot of deer browse and a lot of people experience that horror when they wake up in the morning and their, their plant is mm -hmm. exfoliated. Um, so what a great tip to put in some mountain mint around the edges as a, a barrier. Um, you have other ones that you might recommend that are are great deer resistant plants. I know no plant is entirely resistant if the deer gets hungry enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they're not supposed to like anything that um, is uh, too smelly. Like they leave the peonies alone. We do have a few peonies in this this crazy jungle meadow garden here. Um, and uh, you know anything that's fuzzy or prickly or, or 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 minty, they don't you know the milkweeds they won't touch those because they're they're poisonous um, to the deer. Um, but I mean, a lot of those plants happen to be really awesome pollinator plants. So that you know, I mean, I guess I've I've limited my palate a bit, but. Um, you know, that helps helps me focus on on other things, you know, like when it's a win win. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. We I think we have time for one or two more questions. So uh, pop them in the chat. Oh, great. Nanette had a great comment that Menard is also really deer resistant. And Emily puts in the chat that she loves working with Diana. Uh, what a nice note from Emily. Thank you. Um, I love working with you too. Um, I have a personal question. Um, <laughs> I just uh, started to tackle a gout weed infestation <laughs> in the corner of my yard. I don't know if you have experience with it. Um, and if you know if smothering would be effective because it's quite vigorous and it's, it's spreading via the roots. Rhizomes. Maybe what you could try is um, ripping up the periphery of the rhizomes and then smothering it in the center. Hmm. Okay. Now, it's just so that it will stop creeping out and you can eliminate and just target the mat of the mm. that's right mm. there. That's a great suggestion. It's worth a try. I can't guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's worth, worth a, try. a try. It's a real. It's a real pain to to try to get those all out. It is. Yeah. Uh, another great note from Rachel. Uh, and actually, I think. Um, 
I'll put Thank your you. website link. So if anyone has <laughs> questions after this program or wants to reach out to Diana, um, they can do so through her website. Um, we did record this presentation and we'll share um, later this week the recording and um, maybe put together just a couple resources that we talked about um, tonight and during the, the Q&A. Um, and then what, let's do one final question from Lynn and then we'll close for the night. And she had any specific knotweed recommendations that you have? Oh, that's the, that's the toughest thing. Um, you have to dig really, really deep and you can't use a weed wrench on it. Uh, I mean, it, it just, it breaks. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the worst one because it's so evasive and it's so persistent. Um, I mean, you could try, um, solarizing it um but if you really dig it up um you can you know at least keep it at bay um that's the one plant that i've you know i've heard a lot of people like at, at native plant trust say that that's the one that they have to use the uh the chemicals on and um i don't i don't want to do that i'm i'm seeing some knotweed coming up in my yard this spring and I'm busily trying to dig it up, but you just have to just get the whole thing if you can and it's hard. So good luck. It's, yeah. it's that's the worst, I think. <laughs> yeah, I believe the town conservation department is is trying a method of mowing three times a year. Mm -hmm. Um just try and like out out compete it in terms of depleting the resources but they haven't they haven't done it yet to see if it really does work um, hopefully that does, that, that's good for a larger patch but yeah if you have an isolated couple I think trying to dig them out and just slowly yeah. clear it is is the way to go yeah yeah well thank you Diana for taking the time with us to share your expertise and beautiful photos um, really inspiring and and what a great way to, to make building a, a pocket meadow accessible for um, a lot more people and, and hopefully get folks excited to build their own. Yay, great. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you everybody. Have a great evening. Hey, thank you.